Good to go. The chair notes the time is 6.01. I call the meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I wanna welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Present. Mr. Everald Henry. Mr. Philip White. Present. Ms. Hilda Greenbaum. Present. Four members answered present. A quorum, a, a quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Christine Brestrup, planning director for the town, and Mr. Rob Wachilla, planner for the town. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, extended by chapter two of the acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of a members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. And they may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel or its ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarifications or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to, to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen or by pressing pound nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Tonight's agenda, ZBA FY 2024-03, Valley Community Development Corporation, request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40B, to construct 30 owner-occupied affordable residential units located in 15 duplex structures, parking areas with 58 spaces, common areas and other site improvements on a 9.047 acre site with requested waivers from the zoning bylaw, general bylaws, subdivision regulations, and sewer water connection approvals at 20 to 40 Ball Lane, Map 5A, Parcel 56, RN Neighborhood Residence, and RLD Low Density Residential Zoning District. FC Farmland Conservation Overlay Zoning District. Following our discussion of that application, general public comment uh, on matters not before the board tonight and other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. Tonight's first order of business is the consideration of ZBA FY 2024-03 Valley Community Development Corporation request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B. Are there any disclosures for the board? We had a site visit on Tuesday, October 31st. We walked the site from the entrance off Montague Road. We observed the closest existing houses. We observed where the new houses are planned to be constructed. We walked the property line, observed the wetlands, went back to the proposed parking areas and observed the meadow. And we also walked and observed the stormwater infiltration basin. I think that adequately summarizes our site visit. Mr. White, do you have anything to add to that? I do not, Mr. Chair. 
Um, and then we do have one new submission, and that is uh, which is a memo from Wad, Rob Wachilla listing the questions asked at the site visit and the schedule of the hearings on this application and the topics for each meeting. I understand that the applicant's going to respond to those questions that were raised, um, and we will deal with that in the, in the presentation. And before I go any further, I notice that Ms. Brestrup has her hand up. Um, did you need to say something, Ms. Brestrup? I wanted to note that um, Carolyn Murray of KP Law is here. I oh. don't know if she, her name was mentioned, and I wanted to welcome her and thank her for attending tonight and um, just acknowledge that she's here. Thank you. Well, thank you. I meant to do that, and I should have put that um, in my opening remarks. And I'm sorry, Carolyn. Thank you for attending. Um, this application proposes a significant housing development, including 30 new homes. As such, it will require several meetings with ZBA to complete consideration of the comprehensive permit. Members of the ZBA have agreed to meet on alternate, alternate Thursdays when we do not normally meet to accelerate the consideration of this proposal and to avoid delaying other matters that will come before the board in the next couple of months. Tonight, our topic includes site design, landscape and screening, lighting and parking. Future meetings will have specific topical focus on November 30th will be architecture and mechanical systems. On December 7th, stormwater management and stormwater infrastructure design. On December 21st, property management, income restrictions, financials, the application selection process and local preference. And we will have to have a final meeting, the date which will, be, will have to be determined because of schedules of myself and other members of the ZBA, but sometime in January, early February, that will deal with waivers, conditions and findings. Consideration of a comprehensive permit is a little different than consideration of most of our other special permits. For example, under 40B, all of the municipal permits and any other matters not governed by the state are to be decided by the ZBA. So are there any questions from board members regarding the process for consideration of the comprehensive permit and what we intend to do tonight? Okay, so who's, rep oh, and before we continue, I note Mr. Henry's presence. So we have all five members and paneled for the, uh, for this subject at the, on, on the hearing tonight. So who's representing the applicant tonight? Please identify yourself and give your address for the record. Hi, my name is Jessica Allen. I'm real estate project manager with Valley Community Development. Um, I live in East Hampton. Great, thank you. Um, you can proceed. Sure, um, I would like to ask the chair to promote two members of my design team to the webinar. That would be Peter Flinker and Lee Jennings. They are representatives of Dodson and Flinker and the landscape architects for this project. Great, uh, we, we'll do that. And before you, when they come on, they can just give their name for the record. Okay. Ms. Uh, Ms. Jennings, you're muted. Yeah. Hello, I'm Lee Jennings. Uh, I live in Amherst, Massachusetts. And I'm Peter Flinker. I'm president of Dodson and Flinker in Florence, and I live in Leeds, Massachusetts. Thank you. All so right, Ms. Allen, go ahead. Sure. I'm just going to turn the presentation right over to our landscape architects, and they can walk us through the site design concepts and get into all the nitty gritty details of the uh, site plan, landscape plan, and lighting plan. I'm just going to share my screen for a moment. So I'm going to start, give you a little bit of an overview sort of how we ended up with the master plan approach that we've taken. And then Lee is going to go into a little more detail about the details. Um, we have before you go before you go any further, I'm going to I'm not operating on my <clears throat> normal computer. And so, Rob, if people do have their hand up, um, members of the board or you or, or Ms. Brustrup have their hand up, I won't see it on the current way my uh, my screen is. So will you please recognize them and use my, you have my permission to recognize people who've raised their hand. Okay. Do I also have permission, Mr. Chair, to interrupt during the presentation to do so? Or would you rather? Yeah, yeah I think we should let them proceed, okay. you know, let them make the presentation. But if there's a question mm -hmm. for clarification, I think it's valid to interrupt. Yep. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. So you heard an overview about the Provis project previously. We've been, um, sort of working closely with Stonefield Engineering to revise the plans. And so what you see tonight is um, sort of the current current version. I wanted to start with kind of an overview of where the site is in North Amherst, particularly in relationship to the rest of the landscape. It's on the corner, as you know, of uh, Pulpit Hill Road. 
Montague Road, uh, but it's really surrounded by uh, open space and sort of the surrounding block. And you have the, the Mill River Recreation Area along Montague Road, close to the center of North Amherst, and then the Mill River going up to Pulpit Pond. And then to the north, you have the uh, Cherry Hill Golf Course. And so we're really responding to, to this, uh, in particular, as you know, trying to protect the large open meadow on the site because it's really part of this larger landscape complex. And this is zooming in on the site itself. As you know, a few years ago, there were additional houses and a large structure which have been demolished since the time this photograph was taken. There is an existing house on the site which will remain, which will be split off as a separate parcel with frontage off of Ball Lane. Uh, but we really, at the start of the project, we really looked at lots of different options for accessing the site, <clears throat> providing uh, parking and so on. We looked at using Ball Lane itself, have a parking lot right off of Ball Lane, have a road perhaps connecting Ball Lane to Pulpit Hill Road, have a road connecting Montague Road to Pulpit Hill Road. And basically we ended up on, uh, which you'll see in a few minutes, uh, a plan that really tries to respect the, the most important parts of the site from a public perspective, which is literally the view from, from the road and also the protecting the wetlands on the southeastern side of the site. And then truly really might try to make as good use as possible of the area that was already disturbed and protect the, the large existing trees that are along the frontage. So we have a few photographs of the site. You're familiar with it from the site visit, of course, but this on the left, the, the view from Pulpit Hill Road, Montague Road intersection is really key and trying to keep, you know, from the beginning, we're trying to keep the village of new homes sort of behind that tree line. So that as you look down Montague Road, um, from each direction, you don't really see the project, you see the trees, and behind the trees, there's a cluster of, of new homes. The next slide shows the center of the site, and this you will see the, the project from the center of the site, but we're really also trying to take advantage of the, the, the sort of a gentle knoll with beautiful views to the north um, that many of the houses will enjoy, and really trying to preserve uh, that essence of that landscape while making better use of this, which is the, the foot, footings and parking areas of the former uh, truck, trucking depot. So the next, oh, and then also the, the riparian corridor. This is an intermittent stream that flows on the, the southeastern port of the site. Um, it's sort of a lovely little dell with a lot of maple trees and skunk cabbages in the spring and this intermittent stream that flows down toward the Mill River. So this is our, our overall site design. And as I said, it's really trying to cluster parking on each end with a very short entrance road so that you get people out of the cars. And then the interior is entirely pedestrian. So that allows us to preserve the, the big meadow along the roadside, which is outlined in a dashed yellow line. Uh, and then to you, we're using the stormwater to really extend that open space. So the stormwater is integrated as the edge of the meadow um, several different basins, but it'll be planted with native species that'll extend the sort of natural native cover of the preserved meadow and really block a lot of the view of the, the bottoms of the detention basins from the roadside as well as from the, um, the upper side where the houses are. So we're really concentrating development. One of the things that's driving this is the passive solar orientation for the houses which resulted in uh, sort of the ideal arrangement for that is to have the long side of the houses facing south. So you'll hear more about architecture later on, uh, but really there's been a lot of attention to trying to, while lining up all the houses the same way, also break up the way they're arranged so it doesn't just look like a row of barracks lined up along a straight road. So the, the central pedestrian spine sort of curves gently um, to provide a series of different views. And part of it is those views is this orientation around several different common lawn areas. So as you travel down to get from the parking areas to the homes, you'll come to these small open spaces, which will be defined by vegetation and some fencing. Um, and that really will separate the public space from the private space of each of the, the houses. 
Again, the parking is consolidated in the two separate lots with access off of sort of split in half, half of it from Pulpit Hill Road and half from Montague Road, about 28 spaces on one side, 30 on the other. So we're providing essentially two spaces per unit. Uh, and then that central pedestrian path will connect the two, which while also serving as sort of public safety connection, it'll be 12 feet wide with reinforced turf so shoulders so the if and when the um, fire trucks have to go, they can use that whole area, both the 12 foot in the center and three feet on either side. And then the secondary paths connect to all of the units. Uh, they'll all be uh, essentially accessible from ground level with, without uh, going over 5% grades, I think. And then there'll be a separate sidewalk connection to the left-hand side of the picture here. That dash line shows a new sidewalk connection that will lead to the bus stop at the corner of Pulpit Hill Road. And then around each house, we've set aside a limited use area, which will be exclusive use for the owners of each of the units from 2,700 to 3,900 square feet. And basically the, the red dashes just show two of those, but all the houses have a limited use area. And within that, the homeowners will be able to take care of their own yards. They could put up fences um, and plantings and so on, and really work that up the way they want to see it uh, in the future. So now Lee's going to take this a little further and talk about some of the details. Hello. So I'm going to pick up and talk about um, the parking. As Peter mentioned, we have two parking areas, and each of them will have um, EV spaces. So we'll have eight EV spaces and four EV ready spaces. Adjacent to adjacent to each of the parking areas, we'll have um, our dumpsters and dumpster enclosures. And later we can show um, the <clears throat> studies that show how the trucks can get in and out of these spaces. Um, and there's also pedestrian access to these dumpsters. And then nearby the parking lot will also have two mail uh, and cart storage areas. The idea that residents um, can share carts to transport items from the parking lot to their residences. There's also a bulletin board uh, and a, a bench in these um, mail sheds. Uh, it was important to preserve the existing large trees on the site for screening. And so we were able to project the large uh, maples along Montague Road and the um, hemlock hedge along Ball Lane. And there's another uh, arborvitae and forsythia hedge along the eastern property line. And of course, the woodland and the riparian area are not disturbed. Because of the solar panels on the site, we wanted to make sure that we weren't planting trees that would block them uh, over time. So we're using um, smaller flowering species closer to the homes and then larger shade canopy trees along the meadow edge and near the parking lots where um, we can <clears throat> have larger trees and not impact the solar panels. Uh, it was important to provide screening for the abutters. So at the northeast corner, we'll have an eight foot privacy fence and evergreen planting. And then we also have a six foot privacy fence that will be installed um, adjacent to each of the parking areas to screen those residences from the parking lots. We are planting, uh, we're calling it a meadow edge pollinator mix. So it will be um, containerized plant material that will be installed adjacent to the parking areas and along uh, the edge of the residences along the meadow that's existing. And that will be a mix of pollinator plants and taller grasses to provide screening and to help kind of blend the planting into the existing meadow. Looking more closely at um, a grouping of units, we can see that each unit will have its limited use area, which is shown by the dashed lines. 
and there will be a front entry walk to a porch and then a shared garden space in front of each residence that would be under the purview of the homeowners association. Each residence will also have a rear patio that will have a connection to their outdoor storage area that's part of the building but accessed from the exterior. And there will be a 16 foot long panel of six foot high fencing to separate and provide privacy between the two rear yards. For lighting, um, it was important to provide um, a sense of safety and security on the site and to not over light the site. And so we identified three types of fixtures to use um, along the central spine, which is the darker orange, we're using a 12 foot tall post top um, fixture. And then to light the secondary pathways, we're using a 42 inch tall bollard. And in the parking areas, we'll have a 14 foot tall arm mounted fixture that's the same type of luminaire as the post top. And we, um, We'll have all of these on a photo cell, and it will also have a motion detector so that it can be set to um, be more dim late at night or early in the morning and then get a little bit brighter when motion is detected. We were targeting the um, IES recommendations for parking lots um, in terms of our foot candles and the um, recommended pedestrian path foot candles um, that we've found to be standard in many locations. Um, all of these lights meet the town's lighting standards. The, they're dark sky compliant, and also um, there's no light trespass onto the adjacent properties through the use of different shielding um, techniques on the fixtures. So Lee, I don't mean to interrupt, but we actually do have a hand raise from okay. um, Everald Henry. Okay. If you can hear us, I don't know if his screen's frozen. Um, he looks frozen a little bit. I can hear him. You can. I can't hear him. No, I we can't. Can. Drop. Um, oh, Ms. Jennings. There you go. Yes. Can you, can you, I hear Hilda. I can hear you now. Okay. So in, in looking at this um, diagram, okay, is there more than one parking structure structures or is it just the one at the front on, on my screens to the left? Or is there more um, based on? There's there's two parking locations, one off of Pulpit are. Hill Road and one off of Montague Road. Okay. And and are they, is the intent to designate based on where the house is located or are they open to the entire community? I don't think we've gotten that far. Um, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, can I jump in? Leah, sure. that's okay. um, so the intent is that these are for residents parking. This, these parking lots are not open to the public. Are you talking about the EV specifically? I, think we I thought he meant if depending on which unit are you assigned a parking lot. No, I don't think we're gonna. The, that is not the intent. Um, again, if it makes sense to do so, we could, but that has not been the um, the approach that we've been going with in terms of assigning parking spaces to individuals. So we do have another hand raised by Craig. Um, oh, Everald, can you hear us? I can't see the screen anymore. No, I was. I, I'm. I'm asking because um, the. I, I was trying to understand where the parking relationship to the houses were, and if the person, um, to the farthest house has to go to the, um. 
the parking structure farthest to the left, but I understand it's not assigned yet or haven't been discussed yet as one to understand. I, yeah, that. and I, I will note though that we did make sure that the, the buildings that are accessible um, are closest to the parking areas and closest to the handicapped parking spaces. So that was an intentional um, siting of those, of those homes to be closest to the parking areas. Okay. So Craig, did you still wanna ask your question? I noticed you put your hand down. I, I can ask it later. I don't, I don't okay. want to interrupt the flow of what they're talking about so that they can they can go on and finish their their poor, what they're presenting and then I can ask the question about the EV that was just mentioned. Okay. Um, Hilda has her hand up as well. Yeah, this I thought that what Everett was talking about was number one, guest parking, whether they could park there, but the proximity to the bus stop is could be an issue of people of parking and not paying and going on to UMass. It's 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 North Amherst and very near to a bus stop that takes kids to North to UMass. So I thought that might be what he was addressing. How to control a parking lot to visit to residents only and how do you designate who's a real guest? Just to put them on the table to think about. Okay, we will note that. And I'm gonna move on from lighting now. Um, this is just to show um, a view with the homes in it from Pulpit Hill Road, showing how they're tucked behind the um, existing trees and the stormwater basin. And another view showing that central spine with the reinforced turf shoulder and the common lawn area. This gives an idea of that central spine looking at the site um, from Montague Road side. And another view looking towards the northeast and where you can see the common lawn areas. So I have a full set of landscape drawings that were in your packet. And I'm just going to touch on a few important things in those drawings. And then if we need to go back and reference anything, I'm happy to do that. So it, we've covered met, uh, the materials in our earlier discussion. In terms of the planting, I wanted to point out the large area of the site where the existing plant material is preserved, the meadow and the wooded area and the large trees. And then everywhere else that's disturbed for the most part on the site will be um, planted with a no mow turf which will allow residents to have um, a simple, easy to maintain um, starting point for their own limited use areas. There will be um, seeded turf lawn in the common lawn areas, which will be maintained as a lawn typically is with more frequent mowing so that it's easier to recreate in those areas. And then we'll have that reinforced vehicular turf to provide the necessary width for the fire trucks along the central spine. In the stormwater uh, infiltration areas, there'll be a moist site native seed mix planted, and that will be maintained through mowing twice a year. And then in the areas outside of that, that will be disturbed because of grading on the site. We plan to replant with a wildflower seed mix. And in the areas closer to um, where people are living and parking, we're planting container plants and a, we're calling it the meadow edge pollinator mix that is the mix of taller grasses and flowering perennials. Um, looking at uh, the planting plan in a little bit more detail. We can see the smaller flowering trees along the central spine and near the homes and the larger trees near the parking area. And 
masses of shrubs to help define some of the corners and edges of these spaces. And this is a good view to see the evergreen planting along the Northeast abutters where there's a mix of um, pine, white pine, uh, arborvitae and American holly and um, juniper. Um, our planting palette is um, all native with the exception of some crab apple and um, a cornice kusa dogwood. Um, and so it was important to us to use uh, native plants with a lot of habitat value. Uh, the nomo is a um, type of turf that's uh, installed as a seed and it's a mixture of um, different types of fescue. And so it only needs to be mowed two times a year, usually in June to remove the seed heads. And they, then again in late fall, if a homeowner wants to have a more clipped looking lawn, then they can mow it about once a month to keep it at four inches tall. Um, we talked about the um, central spine as a pedestrian spine, um, but it will have emergency vehicle access. So at each of the uh, entries, there will be a, a mountable curb and granite bollards on either side, which if it becomes necessary, a chain could be added to prevent uh, vehicles from driving. There will also be um, signs at each of those entrances indicating that um, only emergency vehicles are allowed. Um, we have a couple of different types of fencing, the privacy fencing at the butters, and then when we're um, installing privacy fencing between the two units in the rear yard, we're using a slightly different style that is more of a two-sided fence. And um, these are just from the drawing set showing how we've studied the fire truck access and how that can work along this curve and also the um, trash truck <clears throat> and accessing the dumpster. And you'll notice at the Pulpit Hill Road parking lot, one of the reasons why we have the temporary spaces in that location is so that we can get the trash truck in and out of the dumpster enclosures there. Uh, and the hatching is showing the um, snow storage locations. This is just um, showing, I know there was questions about the wildlife. So this is the designated wildlife corridor. Uh, and so our site is right along that southwest corner of the pink area. And um, we have spaces through the site that will not be fenced. So there, it is possible for wildlife to um, pass north to south on the site. And I think that's, that's it for me. We've talked about this already. So I'm gonna stop and open up the floor. Great. Um, thank you very much. So I just had a couple of quick questions and then uh, open it up to the rest of the board members. Can you do you have a drawing of the um, containerized pollinator planters and what are they going to look like? Are they going to be is it a row of planters as individual planters? And how do we expect the um, if so, how do we expect the tenants or the new owners to take care of those and maintain them? Um, so they're. I guess it's probably using too much um, jargon, the container plant, meaning that when we install it, it comes out of a container as opposed to being planted as a seed. Oh, oh so you don't have it. You're not planting them in a container. Correct. And so it's planted in the ground. Okay, yes. that, that makes more sense to me. All right. Um, and then the other question I had is, let's go back to the, uh, what is, 
what is reinforced vehicular turf? Is that just um, cement block with holes in it? The grass grows up through those holes or is it something different? Um, well, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, it's a plastic grid um, that the grass grows up through. So it's not, it's not concrete. And mm -hmm. um, you, you will, if it when once it's grown in, you won't see that plastic. Got it. Okay. But it provides a, um, a, a more uh, traffic resistant Correct. Uh, surface that won't be depressed by a, a heavy truck driving on it as right. an emergency and, vehicle. Yeah. And okay. it's really there for the um the supports from the fire truck when they need to put those out from the truck. Right. Uh, and it's most of the structure comes from it being installed on about 12 inches of gravel below. So, that, that so you have you, maybe that four to six inches of topsoil with the plastic grid. And then below that is is the gravel. And so that gives you a, like a six is it would be a 16 foot wide path then for the in, in effect, you have a 12, 12 foot wide walking path and then six feet of three feet on each side yes okay so you get 16 feet of all right eight, am i eight. 18 feet yes 12 plus six would be 18 yes good thank you for catching that and the, the last question i have is the concrete bollards where are they going to be placed and if there's a potential for a, a chain are they across the the pedestrian walk or do they uh, are they along the pedestrian walk um, so they're placed on, um, either side of the pedestrian spine, um, and the chain, if needed, would go across. And so then there would be some way for emergency vehicles, the emergency res first responders to open up that chain? Right. I mean, I think the idea is that anybody can open up the chain. It's... Uh, but it's there to deter people. Got it. Okay. All right. And, and there'll be the there'll be granite. Granite. All right. I don't have any other questions right now. Um, Mr. Meadows, I see your hands up. My question relates to something that was said uh, at the at the last meeting that the EV stations were, were going to be wired, but they weren't going to be put in. Um, and I, my understanding is that the state has $50,000 per EV station available. And I found out this last week at a conference I went to that the federal government has $100,000 additionally available. So if you were planning on not actually putting the EV stations in, I might suggest that this is a good time to actually find out where that money is and um, make use of it so that you have EV stations. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just to clarify. So we were planning to wire for eight and then leave um, and have eight, eight um, spaces available with EV from the beginning with wiring for an additional four. So a total of 12, but eight being available at the get-go. But I will look into that money and uh, see if I can find some more information on it. That's good for us to know. Any other questions, Mr. Meadow? No, thank you. Okay, Mr. White, your hand was up next. Um, yes, forgive me, I'm not super familiar with it, but do you know what are the watering requirements for the NOMO? Um, just because my concern is since we're looking at costs, you know, after the sale uh, and trying to keep them as low as possible. Are you from, do you have that information right in front of you? Well, like all grass, it will need to be watered during establishment regularly. And so that will be for a period of a couple of months. And then um, after that, it performs like um, typical native grasses, um, and it it should be okay except in periods of extreme drought. 
Um, and then my other question is related to the no mow grass. Uh, sorry, I've never heard of it before. Um, are you aware if it has any sort of negative um, effects on any sort of pollinators in the area? Well, I mean, it will be cut to not have its seed heads. Um, so um, turf grass and all types of turf grass have less pollinator value than other plant material. Um, but to provide a kind of um, base level of ground coverage around the units, we thought that this was the best material to start with. Yeah, it's sort of a it's sort of a compromise, you know, between you know just having a ground cover that never gets mowed, and the practicality of people. You know, everybody wants a lawn, at least somewhat, especially if you have kids. I think because it's kept longer, and it's uh, the sort of fescues, um, it's going to have naturally better insect habitat than um, a traditional, you know, bluegrass heavy turf that gets mowed short. Um, but it, it is going to depend on the maintenance, it's basically how often it gets mowed. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Ms. Greenbaum. Can you hear me? Yep. <clears throat> Once you've disabled my video, that's why you can't see me. Okay, I have two questions. And did I mention this in the places of report or not? Did you mention that we need to remember to do a waiver for the A and R? Was that part of your site report? Because I don't remember hearing it. You might have said we did. I did not mention that, Miss um, Greenbaum. That is a, a good catch. I'm, I think it might be in. Was that in the questions, Rob? So it was in the questions. Um, I guess we could discuss it now since it, it's been brought up by Hilda. Um, so, um, and this question is also for Carolyn, who's the council on staff for, for this particular permit. Um, so the current building on the property is occupied by tenants and the applicant is intending the section off that parcel to be sold um, separately from the lot that's gonna be carved for this project. So. I guess one question we wanted to clarify was that essentially they're creating a new lot that doesn't have the required frontage to be considered a billable lot. And the applicant was hoping to go through the A&R process so they could sell that lot to somebody else. And we were having a discussion about this earlier, just as a staff um, as to whether, you know, what would be the process to move that forward if they don't meet the dimensional requirements per local zoning to get their a &R plan endorsed by um, the, the town planning board or to have it submitted with the registry of deeds. I know this was brought up a while ago, Carolyn. I'm sure you're familiar with this question. So we, we figured we'd ask and see if there is an appropriate avenue to go for that sort of thing. Right, thanks, Rob. We mm -hmm. did discuss that a while ago. And I think at one point we also talked about the possibility of it being treated as a flag lot. I don't remember quite where we landed on that aspect of it, but but to your to the broader question about the A and R plan, by definition, you know, an A and R plan would need the requisite frontage on a way in order for um, the plan to actually be endorsed. So if it's left without that requisite frontage, your only other option then is as a subdivision plan. Now the zoning board in the context of a comprehensive permit um, could actually consider a subdivision plan or an ANR plan um, you know if this if this lot to sort of be carved out had the sufficient frontage I will say that there has been uh, a little difference of opinion in some of those of us in the legal community as to when the zoning board, as you were saying at the outset of the hearing tonight, uh, Mr. Chair, you were saying that you know the zoning board acts in place of all local boards um, acting mm -hmm. under local regulations, but not necessarily state law. 
So right. typically when it comes to Title V, you still have to go to the Board of Health. The Wetlands Protection Act, you would still have to go to the Conservation Commission. There is, however, a slight difference of opinion as to how the subdivision control law comes into play, because while the subdivision control law is in fact a state statute, the subdivision control law doesn't actually have any particular standards. It just allows each city or town that adopts the subdivision control law to develop those subdivision standards. Um, I know that I have seen both uh, subdivision plans as well as A&R plans endorsed in the context of a comprehensive permit application. I have seen sometimes where the zoning board will actually endorse the A&R plan and has actually signed it saying, um, pursuant to the authority uh, vested in the Zoning Board of Appeals under Chapter 40B, we hereby endorse this plan. I've seen other situations where the comprehensive permit decision has included a condition that basically says the planning board shall endorse this plan. Um, and I know back a few months ago when Christine and Rob and I were talking about this situation, um, the Housing Appeals Committee has also said in its decision um, that it does believe that you know an ANR plan or subdivision plan um, or subdivision requirements could be considered by the zoning board in the context of a 40B. Having said that, I will also tell you there is a case that's currently pending with the Superior Court um, that's challenging exactly that issue. Um, I doubt that that is going to be decided by the time this board reaches any kind of decision on this matter. And even if that court did reach a decision, it would only be a superior court case decision. It wouldn't have any um, precedential value um, to this, to Amherst or to this particular project. Um, but in my opinion, the the, um, the zoning board can look at an ANR plan, can consider ZBA regulations in the context of the 40B. Yeah, I guess it was because that particular lot is part of the larger parcel that, that, it, that it came up that they need to ask the way. My second question has to do with most of the site is, is in plant material, except for the walking roads. And this is a family subdivision or family project of, of Presumably, children of various ages. Some might want to have a basketball hoop. Little children might want a place to put their little vehicles, their three and four wheel things to, to ride around. And the only seems to be there is the public way. And in the past, the precedent has been for family housing to have a place where children can play with other children. It doesn't seem to be a place in each yard for a basketball hoop because everything is grass or, or some other flowers. And so I'm asking if there is a place where children can ride their tricycles. That's one question. And big kids can put up a hoop. And then the issue of visitors, teenage visitors or younger, older, whatever, who come with bicycles, shouldn't they have a place other than in somebody's shed to store their bicycle with a bicycle rack when they come to visit? And in the past, we required these things to be available where there were families living, and we should put that on our list to think about. That's it. Ms. Um, Allen, do you want to respond to that? Sure. So uh, I'd like to first respond to her comments about placing for kids to ride tricycles and a place for a basketball hoop. So one of the things we feel pretty strongly about in terms of this um, development is that we want the people who end up buying homes here to have some ownership of their space. Um, we don't want to pre-program everything for them. We don't know if they want a basketball hoop or not. Maybe they want a, um, a play structure instead. Um, 
we don't know what the desire of the home buyers are going to be. And so we'd like to at least leave some flexibility for the home buyers to decide where it makes the most sense for them to put a basketball hoop, where kids would ride tricycles. Maybe they're allowed to ride them up and down the pedestrian way. I don't see a problem with that personally, but, you know, I'm not living there. So, you know, we want to leave some flexibility to the home buyers to be able to program their common spaces. This is their community. So give them the ability to create their community rather than having us come in and say, this is what we think you should be doing in your extracurricular activities. So um, so that's so that's one point. Um, and then in terms of the bicycle storage, again, these are this is not a rental project. This is a home buyers. And so there's there's storage space inside the buildings. There is storage space um, that's exterior. Um, again, we don't feel like it's necessary to, to have bike racks available when it's a home ownership project. Can I respond? Sure. You're not going to like what I say, but I think that's a cop-out. I think when these units cost $671,000, you guys should be responsible, not the homeowners who are getting subsidized housing because they can't afford it. Somebody's making that $671,000 per unit. It should include a place for the kids to play because we make it, we make it, are given for the rental housing. I think that you guys got to find some money in your budget to give the kids a place to play. These are very, very expensive units. You can build a very nice house for $670,000 in a very, very nice neighborhood. And these are 995 square feet to 1,275 square feet, a very small house. They're going to be outdoors a lot playing. So that's just where I'm coming from. I don't know whether anybody supports that or not, but I'm letting you know what I think about that. It's a long way to Mill River, too, for a two-year-old on a tricycle. Um, Ms. Greenbaum, I was, I would, I think one of the areas that might be available for um, for the homeowner association to decide what they want to do. I mean, this doesn't doesn't answer the question that you have: is that it, should it be all provided by the developer, or should it be provided later on by a decision of the homeowners association? But there's an area that for the um, possible community garden is set aside. Could that be? It, that's a flat area, is it not? And could that be used for recreation hoops, perhaps um, other kinds of recreational areas? And, and staying off of the meadow itself, where you don't want a lot of traffic, and, and the wet area where you don't want a lot of traffic. But there is some space that could be dedicated mm -hmm. to a play area, if that's something that the, again, that, that the homeowners want. But it doesn't speak to your question of when it's financed. I Good place. I in the center where you have that green park area, it's sort of like an oval on either sides of the pedestrian road. One of those, maybe the little one, can be paved with a safe pavement for kids. Hmm. Yeah, if I, if, I, if I could jump in, sorry. On the north that. side, yeah. Um, yeah, we we have been thinking about this a lot, and uh, the the play structures themselves are not yet in the picture in terms of purchasing those and installing them, but we have been working hard to try to create a structure that can accommodate play structures, or as just said, any any different kind of things. It could be little um, basketball hoops. It could be for younger kids. It could be for older kids. And so we have these sort of three large turf areas set aside, each of them surrounded by paved paths that are incorporated into the pedestrian network that goes to each of the houses. There are a number of exterior loops that allow people if they're walking their dog or riding a tricycle to make loops around the whole project to get out of the landscape to look at the beautiful meadow to pass all the different shared spaces we're trying to carve out those three big spaces so they serve sort of cl smaller clusters of units so each within the 30 total units there are smaller neighborhoods that surround those shared spaces and so as jess said you know, we're expecting that the, the the owners will sort of program them themselves. Maybe they'll put out some picnic tables, 
create a, a place for a fire pit, uh, to plant more trees, and plant an orchard, or, or dig the whole thing up and have a wonderful vegetable garden. And then we do have a separate space set aside on the edge of the meadow for um, a community garden space, which will include a provision for a shed and a water tap to serve that. So all of the pieces are in place that just need whatever equipment they, they want. Yep. Oh, there's a place for it. I'm just asking for a paved area where kids can safely ride their bicycles and the old people aren't going to fall over them. And uh, as far as a basketball hoop, that you can buy and it's on wheels and wheel it around wherever they want to have it. But I'm yet I'm not asking you to put the equipment out there yet, though I would if it were one of the the rental projects. Um, give them a place to do it because everything is grass. Yeah, it's a and really you good can't point. Try to bike on the grass very well. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the things we realized in terms of hard court, you know, whether it's basketball court or pickleball, there's a lot of pavement that has to be reserved for the turnaround spaces to get into the um, uh, <laughs> the dumpsters. So that's going to be temporary parking only, and those are going to be ideal spaces to put up a basketball hoop or to mark on the on the pavement for games and so on. So again, I think there's, I think it's going to be a really cool place to live and lots of possibilities sort of built into the structure of it. But we did want to give the flexibility for people to shape those areas the way they feel fits their own community the best. Hello, Ms. Greenbaum, do you have another question? Oh, I just think that in, the, in that central area, there's a little place just north of the walking path that, that could be hard for little kids, you know, a hard surface. Mm -hmm. Um, Ms. Perestrep, you had your hand up. Did you want to comment on something? Uh, then I'll go to Mr. Henry. If, if you have something that's commenting on a question that we had. Um, yeah, I wanted, right. to, I wanted to comment on the A&R question. And we have yep. talked about it um, internally. And we've also talked about it with uh, Ms. Murray in the past. And I wanted to make the suggestion that um, uh, the staff could meet with Ms. Murray and with um, Rob Mora and come up with a recommendation for um, the zoning board as to how to handle this. And my memory of our last conversation was that we would try to treat that lot as a flag lot because it doesn't have 120 feet of frontage on the um, on Ball Lane. It's got frontage on Ball Lane, but doesn't have enough frontage. So we could treat it as a flag lot, um, and then we could ask for a waiver from the requirement for a special permit for a flag lot. And we could also ask for a waiver from the um, lot area requirement for a flag lot. That's kind of how I remember, you know, concluding about this, but that was several months ago. So I think it would be good to have staff meet with uh, Ms. Murray and um, really, you know, come up with a firm approach that we could recommend to you. Does that sound good? Yep, I think that makes sense. Thank you. Good. Um, Mr. Henry. I, I want to make a comment. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. So um, in, in reference to what Ms. Greenbaum was saying, I agree with her in part. I, I think these are this is the appropriate time to have those kind of conversations because we're assuming that when people move into this community, they will all agree that's going to be problematic. So I, I, I think... Um, that they, they will all come together and agree on the same thing. It's it's possible, but different opinions mean that somebody may want something different. So I think if we have something on paper, some intent, not binding, but to say, here is what we were thinking, um, that may be helpful. And I think that is potentially what Mr. Greenbaum was alluding to. Um, my question now is um, understanding that there's all this community property um, how much individual outdoor space does each house get for their own personal use? So um, it varies between 2,700 and 3,900 square feet. On this slide, you can see in the dark red that shows kind of a typical amount of space for each unit. Okay. And thank you. 
And my my other question is for Attorney Murray. Um, the case in Superior Court, why would it not be precedent? Is it, is it a specific issue being addressed, argued by a town? Why, why wouldn't someone pay attention to that case, come back and say that the town of Amherst cannot do this because of that case? It, it would not be precedent setting, setting because at this point, it would only be a Superior Court level decision. It would have to be appealed further. So there's no to an appellate court level. So I was going to say, is um, if is there no possibility that uh, when the Superior Court makes a decision, um, one side may not accept it, and then he, I understand, you know, we to your point, appeals take years, right. and this probably would have been already done by then. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and the Superior Court case was only argued. Um, I believe back in May. So I think we're a long way away from um, an appeal. And I actually wouldn't be surprised that given that it's also within the context of a, a 40B case that has been out there for, I think it's been close to 15 years. I wouldn't be surprised if the parties just come to some sort of um, resolution rather than appeal it further. But um, I've been wrong before. I could be wrong again, but I'll certainly keep you posted if there's any development on that case. And given that this, um, we have this in our issue, and if the and if the zoning board um, votes to allow this with the current issue as it stands, does that create a precedent to say if another project with these similar sort of circumstances come up again? Um, someone wouldn't challenge and say, um, you, you can't do this, or would we, would the board still be allowed to do this on a different site with similar issues? Unless between now and whenever your next application comes in, unless there is actually an appellate court decision that definitively tells us what the zoning board can or cannot do in the context of a 40B, then, um, is it possible that another application comes in and someone challenges whether you can or cannot do this? Sure, it is possible. But as I said, I can also point to other 40Bs where an ANR plan has been endorsed or even a subdivision plan has been endorsed. And when those have been appealed to the Housing Appeals Committee, there is no issue raised by them as to whether or not the ZBA has that authority. Thank you. Sure. I'd like to return to the uh, thing that Mr. Meadows mentioned, and that is the, subs the potential for additional subsidies, both state and federal for EV stations. I assume that, in, and perhaps this is a, a more appropriate discussion when we talk about the financials later on, but I want to get you started to think about this in case it's we can address it later. But I, I expect that you did not incorporate into your financing that there was an ability, there were certain subsidies available from state and federal governments, or maybe this you'll you you might find that there's more subsidy available now than you planned to begin with. Um, and if that is the case that would mean there might be some additional funds left over or a reduction in your in your construction costs and your development costs. And I don't know if there's been any thought given or maybe you could give some thought to uh, whether there's an ability to capitalize some kind with that savings um, to capitalize something for the homeowners association for development later on uh, and, and then have that be part of the homeowners associations um, when they get it, they have a certain amount of money that has comes from either the contingency fund or from additional subsidization that we didn't realize was that you didn't realize was available. And if that is combined with some kind of here's some possibilities for play areas or other or things you may want to do, not doing them right then, but also giving them some means to do it, it might be a really uh, an advantageous thing. So you can't answer that right now. I'm not expecting that an answer from you, Mrs. Ms. Allen, right now, but I think that if there is additional money available, some thought could be given to capitalizing the homeowner association to give, knowing that these are moderate income people, they probably are, are not coming with a lot of uh, spare income right now. But mm -hmm. if there's some kind of a capitalized fund to start, 
It might make the ability for them to decide what they want to do. The, mm -hmm. the thing that Mr. Henry talked about might make it easier to come to a, uh, a decision. Sure. So maybe we can talk about that in, I think it's in de December when we deal with financials. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Are there any other, oh, Mr. Meadows. Well, I, I, I was gonna go on that same vein um, and I was gonna wait until we talked either about financials or the architectural, but just to give you some information that I've learned in this last week, um, ground source heat pumps are, are overall less costly than standard air source heat pumps, primarily because there's a 50% tax credit for them. And if they're affordable housing, then it's an additional 25% on top of that. So by the time you take a 75% tax credit, your costs have gone down considerably. There's also up to 70% uh, tax credit for solar on a federal level. level. Um, lighting, there's money available for lighting that there wasn't available before. And I don't, I, I assume you've looked into all of these things, but just to give you a heads up, they are available now. Sure, what makes it a little complicated is that, you know, in our rental deals, um, when we have tax credit, when we're doing low income housing tax credit, there's a, there's a partnership because somebody needs to be a taxable income. We are a nonprofit, so we are not taxable. So the idea here is that we're a nonprofit building these houses and then we're selling them immediately to home buyers. So there isn't going to be a taxable entity as part of this project. It's different from a rental where we're, you know, somebody is being taxed is a taxable entity for 15 years. Um, for that project. Um, sorry, you keep jumping around on the on the Zoom. <laughs> I feel like I'm, looking, I'm looking at one place and then you shift. So um, sorry if I look like I'm a little dazed here. Um, so that has been, you know, my initial look at the at the federal money that's coming down for home buyers with solar is that if it's you, you need to have that taxable entity and we're a nonprofit. So I, I need to dig into it a little bit more, whether the homeowners association itself becomes some sort of LLC, which I need to talk to my attorney about, you know, that could be a potential opportunity, but we haven't been able to dig down that far into it. And our initial conversations um, with um, our attorney was that it probably shouldn't be an LLC because there's too many filing requirements and it, there, it wasn't, it, it didn't need to be. Um, but again, it's something that I can look into when we get to the financial piece a little bit more, and I'll dig into that. Um, so there's that. But my understanding is that it, prior, they were not available, but now the credits are transferable. You can sell them. You can, yeah. you, you can sell a, a lot of the uh, incentives that are available and uh, the deductions that are available at the same time. So uh, a, a consideration, uh, we're working with a group in here in New York City area that's called Energy Tax Savers. And I think their address is energytaxsavers.com. I don't think your attorney is going to be a good focal point for looking at this stuff. I would think that you want to have a good, a good accountant who's used to um, what the federal government is doing. Sure. Great, thank you, um, Ms. Greenbaum. Um, I was going to say exactly what Craig said that that apparently Jones Library is selling tax credits to support their enterprise. Um, I I've been trying to email um, Rob to please turn me back on. You guys got me locked up in a cage. I can't. I can't start video from my end. Um, I'm locked out. There cool. should be a button at the bottom of your screen, Hilda. No, I'm on my iPad. It won't. It won't work. If you tap on the screen once, it should come it up. It says at the you're. You cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. Okay. 
it's you got you you, you locked me out. Let me door. see if I can I can fix that for you. We can continue yeah. with the meeting, but I can let me fix that. Yeah, no, I wrote you I wrote you an email because there's no chat. All right, he'll work on that. He'll have, I'm sure okay. that was not uh, yeah, well, nobody. Was not nobody intended to, to lock you out. It wasn't meant to be. Oh, stop <laughs> my video. Okay. There we okay. go. Okay. Nope. Oh, it was there for a second. There you there. go. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Um. So I, I guess I, I'd have a, a quick question for Ms. Brestrup. So if we're looking at it as a flag lot, the potential that when you're, we're going to discuss this, the potential is for you to come back to us with a solution that we may be able to to resolve as the ZBA and not have to go to the planning board or other entities in town to to do this, right? So that we can use the the um, the authority or the, the the authority given under 40B to make these decisions ourselves. Is that correct? Well, I guess in what our... I was thinking. Um was that you would grant waivers from the requirement mm -hmm. for the special permit for a flag lot and the size of the flag lot, but that the planning board could still sign the ANR. Okay. Um, I would be comfortable with that if attorney Murray would be comfortable with that. But I think we need to talk about it internally with Rob Mora, yep. the building commissioner to make sure that he's comfortable with that so that we all have a, plan to move forward but that makes the most sense to me i just wanted to, i just wanted to kind of understand where you were heading that makes sense to me too but i know you you guys will <clears throat> discuss this and come back to us with a recommendation that we can then evaluate all right mr meadows i'm sorry there's one other thing that's been bothering me and maybe it's inconsequential but um years ago when uh, the Matuscos had the property and that was a truck stop. Uh, uh, Kipper, who was Chet Matusko's younger brother on the east side of the building, did all of his auto truck repair. And I just wanted to make sure that you had tested the soil there to make there isn't anything, any contaminants in the soil that are a problem. No. Uh, so before we acquired the property, we did due diligence for environmental. So we did a phase one and a phase two report. The right. phase two had 12 um, test pits that were conducted. They were conducted um, where the records were show had shown that there had been underground storage tanks and some other um, industrial activity that had been flagged at uh, Mass CEP. So we did testing at 12 different locations. Um, all the soil came back clean. That being said, you know, we don't know what's under the slab. So during construction, once we get into construction, if we hit dirty soil, um, there's a whole process. I've gone through it before in my previous job on another project. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You get it tested, you figure out what, what the contaminants are. You, um, you take all the soil out, it gets shipped off far away, usually like Michigan, New York, not Massachusetts. Um, there's a there's a, a, a trip register that has to be done. It gets weighed. It's very expensive, but we've got contingency money. And also in the budget, Commonwealth Builders has additional money that they are recently providing above and beyond the subsidy, which is for any soil work. So anything having to do with site work. So they have already, um, and I believe it's in the pro forma um, that was provided to you, but there is money that they have already um, identified it's up to $2 million. So that's an additional resource that we can utilize if we hit dirty soil and there's a whole process that we need to do to get rid of it. So as far as we know, we've done testing. We haven't come up with anything. If we had, we would have negotiated that before we acquired. Um, but we've got, we've got a plan in place. We've got contingency money just under construction. And then we have this additional money under Commonwealth Builders for soil work. Mr. Wachilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so this issue arose before the application was submitted uh, and us staff kind of heard about it um, for the site. So we understand that, you know, before you guys submitted, Jessica, there was an issue with a high water table on the site. 
Um, and we understand that you might have to do an extra layer or two of fill to, to essentially raise the grade above that water table. Um, so could you explain that a little bit if, if you have the information handy? Um, just I'm because... going to ask, yeah, if you could promote Josh Klein yes. to the meeting and he can he can address that. I will do that right now. Okay. Hopefully he's not in the middle of dinner. <laughs> 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 Thinking you could just get Scott off free and just listen in tonight. All right. He's rejoining now. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Hello, I, I did catch the majority. Is the, Rob, is there anything specific you want me to go through? Or, uh, sure. Is so, um, or no, I, just, just give us your name, Mr. Klein, and address real quickly for the record. Um, so, Josh Klein, I am uh, the engineer for the project, Stoneville Engineering and Design. Um, we're located at 120 Washington Street in Salem, Mass. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so, I guess just to rephrase my question, Josh, uh, to make it easier for you to answer the question. Um, so we understand that there might be the possibility of a high water table on site, and there might be extra fill that's needed to um, essentially raise any structures above that, um, or at least to change the grade to accommodate the high water table. So could you just kind of give us like a brief background on that, and then maybe what will be done uh, during the construction process? Um, just because that that's something that kind of deals with the site design, but also might go into the stormwater aspect as well. Um, so just, just because it was something that was discussed a while ago, and I feel like it wasn't addressed yet during this public hearing process. Yeah, it's no problem. Maybe what I'll do is I'll give a shorter version tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and then during the kind of the stormwater presentation, I can, I'll show it like an exhibit and kind of speak to it a little bit further. But um, the overview is, you know, you know, you are correct. You know, we do have a high water table in this area. We've done two rounds of test pits. Um, you know, kind of one round throughout the site and then one round a little bit more concentrated where our stormwater facilities are going to go. Um, you know, the good news is, you know, we are we really worked really hard to design the site and the location of the stormwater facilities as best we can to minimize unnecessary earthwork. Um, there's also kind of a second driver in terms of, you know, where the elevations that a site sit and it's driven by the sewer and being able to maintain a gravity sewer from ball lane um so there you know we do expect um there to be a fill condition um on the especially on the eastern portion of the site um but what we can do at the upcoming hearing you know we did prepare an earthwork analysis um that we can even kind of colorize and share with the board and i can get into a little bit more detail um you know during that time period Providing that uh, color analysis will definitely be helpful, um, at least during that portion. So thank you for clarifying that and, and uh, bringing that to our attention. All right, are there other questions on the topics, uh, questions from members of the board on the topics that we have before us tonight? Lighting, uh, parking, I, I guess I have one question on parking we're talking about, it, and I haven't, and I confess I haven't read uh, everything that I need to read, but have you given, contem contem have you contemplated uh, a parking control measures? Um, are you setting that up for the, the homeowners association, such as stickers, um, or uh, how do you control, how do you anticipate controlling um, either guest parking or, uh, you know, random people coming and dropping off their car and then jumping on the bus how have you what have you been thinking about that um we haven't gotten to the details of that yet um yep. i think you know a sticker system certainly makes sense um but that would have to be managed by the condo association at the right. end of the day um it's not something that we would be managing but we could certainly assist the condo association in setting up a parking control um system that makes the most sense for them um, Valley will be one of the members of the condo association until enough of the homes have been sold and it can be transferred fully over to the homeowners. So we will play an active role in, in the condo association, at least at the startup, um, until enough of the homes have been, have been sold. 
So then I guess the question I would have is, assuming that there's something at, at, at the beginning of the, the uh, at the inception of the homeowner association, there's some kind of a parking plan. If that parking plan is, is changed later on by the, by the homeowners association, Rob, will that be something that has to come back to the ZBA to approve because it's like a management plan? Uh, we'd have to come back, they'd have to get an approval from us at a public meeting for a change in the in the parking is that the, the so that's kind of the the um, management of this over time so um the way that you're thinking about it is how we attribute it to special permit applications yep. and yep. um the one issue is um so when you grant this comprehensive permit i don't know if it's an easy process to come back to modify it um as it is for a special permit um so we might have to work on a condition that slightly alters that. So instead of, you know, having to modify the comprehensive permit itself, we could require the homeowner association, if that parking plan were to change, they would have to file a special permit to submit that new parking plan for the governance of the site. Um, it would be something that's not connected to this comprehensive permit directly. And Chris, please feel free to jump in if, if I'm missing yeah. something here. But it seems that having it you know be the traditional come back to the zba for a public meeting to discuss any change to the parking plan that might be a little bit tricky to do in the situation chris or um, miss murray miss Brestrup. i'll try first and then maybe uh, miss murray can uh, jump in um so i think the way we've handled this on north square is that we had um, conditions that allowed certain things to happen without any change to the comprehensive permit, certain things that had to come back to a public meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals, and the Zoning Board would determine if it was substantial enough to come back for um, a, a change or an amendment to the comprehensive permit, and then certain things that um, would clearly need an amendment to a comprehensive permit. And I think the amendment to the comprehensive permit is not as you know, monumental um, an operation as this first acquiring of the comprehensive permit, but I'll stop now and maybe Ms. Murray can jump in. Ms. Murray, please. Thank you. So I, I agree with what Christine was saying. Um, you could certainly craft a condition where the board could even go so far as to say um, that, you know, if there are changes, you could, you could request a parking management plan outright. And maybe that just gets incorporated into your decision. You could request that you know the applicant is required at some later date to bring back before the board a parking management plan for the board to consider. You could even go so far as to say that the board would not would not consider um, an alteration um, or addition of a parking management plan would not be considered to be a substantial modification. And in so doing that, they could come back to the ZBA just through a regularly posted meeting, no need for a public hearing or a legal ad, they could just come back before you as an agenda item and present um, the parking management plan to you. So I think I think we could work through it um, mm -hmm. to, to try to set that up to make it a, an easier process if, anything is required to come back after the permit issues. Okay, we'd be able to figure out a way to do it. Okay, thank you. So I don't know who had their hand up first, Ms. Greenbaum or Mr. Henry, uh, but I, I'm i gonna go I with Ms. Greenbaum. You want, or I can yield go ahead. No, go ahead, Ms. Greenbaum. Um, I wanna mention another thing about children. If you look at the first aerial map that the Dodson Flinker presented, you could see a bunch of fields with solar panels on them. That's in the PRP rate region just to the west of me. And on the maps is a subdivision that was denied, but it's still on the maps. And the reason it wasn't built is because it's just too wet. We were supposed to go from, from Montague Road all the way back. Actually, there was a cluster and a, a standard subdivision that was proposed for the site. And they were turned down basically because of the, well, one of four reasons that their land was too wet. So 
that land all around me, south of the solar panels, is hay, which is hayed basically Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, about three or four times during the summer. I can't can we get walk that. Can we get that. Um, can, Rob, can you put that up so we can see what Miss Greenbaum was talking about? I can do it. Is this okay? See the solar field way up in the left corner. My my house is the one. The two roofs there are my two barns, right there. You can't see my finger. Sorry. You see the golf course, right there. I'm right across the street from the golf course, and there are two little barns down there. And right there's there. a salt field. So Got everything it. south of that is mowed, at least three times a year, and it's probably the same kind of soil as as on the Matusko site. And nowadays, with all the wildlife going through there, with the, the insects that attach to them, with Lyme disease and, and various other things, I'm thinking about in the grasses that are going to be uh, surrounding all these, including people's backyards. How do we know that it's safe for kids to play there, that they're not going to get ticks? Or if the dog, if they have a dog and the dog runs into the field, the dog come back with chicks and give it to the baby. Um, I don't know anything about this, but I'm bringing it up as an issue I thought about. There's a, let's see, my house is right there in the barns, and and everything south of there is mowed. As 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 I say, every couple of months over the summer, it's hay. So I'm just raising it an issue. I don't know whether it is or not, but if you don't have mowable glass, grass, is it safe for a baby to crawl around on it and not get tick bites or other things that you can get from what insects are attached to animals? I don't know. Somebody yeah. tell me. Think about it. I, I want to say that the, one of the great things about the no-mo is that... Um, if you only want to mow it twice a year, that's okay. And if you want to mow it more frequently because you have kids that will be using your limited use area and crawling around, that you can do that. But what about the, the fields that you aren't going to mow more than once or twice a year? It is, it is a, a drawback. I mean, we do a lot of school projects and everybody's excited about having poll pollinator meadows but you do have ticks. So one of the things we've learned is to carefully separate the paths of movement from the long grass. So if you have grass along the edge of a path, as we will here, is to mow a, a strip so that as you're walking down the path, your pants aren't brushing up against the long grass. So you don't get ticks unless you get right out into the meadow. Um, and it's, it's obviously a drawback, but this is beautiful North Amherst. It's an agricultural area, a natural area, and... Um, I think I think the idea is to to celebrate that to some extent and not not try to make it. Yeah, well, so I mean, pristine. there's bad, blackberries and everything growing down in the wetlands there, but I don't I don't get dare use them anymore. Well, we used to do it all the time. Well, it's, I I don't know how much is it anticipated that people are going to be walking back into the some of the unmowed areas and into the the meadow and. Um, you know what we're gonna do. Yeah. Our, uh, we used to go in the fields catching butterflies, but there aren't any butterflies anymore. I mean, when I was a child. Yeah. Well, you need the way we've designed it. You you won't have to mo walk into the meadow unless you want to. So right. Um, it it won't be an accidental encounter with whatever's in the meadow, and uh, so that gives people the option. So do we have to put in a permit a condition that requiring them to mow close to the path a certain number of feet? Um, I'm, I'm leaving that out as a question. I mean, that, that could be the kind of condition we, um, we could consider, we can contemplate. Somebody write it down because I won't remember. I've got it. Me too, Hilda. I'm writing it down right now.
Okay, I, I can't see the rest of the people. So Rob, if, if there's any other hands up, um, would you please uh, recognize whoever it is? Uh, Mr. Henry, I think, had yep, his hand Mr. up Henry. earlier. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, Rob. I, I, I had a comment slash question on the revised parking plan. Um, it, it seemed a little bit overly burdensome if after this project is built and the parking spaces are there, um, that the homeowners have to come back before the ZBA if they decide to do something um, in terms of how people park on the property. So I'm just trying to understand why they would need to come back before the ZBA um, to for us to give them permission to, quite frankly, um, allocate how they use their own parking structure, given that there's nothing structurally changing. That seems overly burdensome to me. Is that absolutely necessary? Wouldn't that be something that the HOA decide on their own, how their parking is used? Well, I think that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, the, the question is, is there a parking plan to begin with? Um, is, since there's not the, a homeowners association doesn't exist until later on. So, I mean, I think it's probably beneficial to require a, a parking, uh, a parking plan because you have a, we could be seeing, uh, you know, lots of um, itinerant parking for lack of a better term in there. And you'd want to have some kind of, a, um, you'd want to make sure that the development has a parking, has a parking plan identified. Um, because we do that almost for almost any kind of uh, special permit when there's parking um, provided and there's potential for parking to be misused or students to park in it or there, there's to be parking outside the parking lot. And that's so we do it in other cases. Um, I guess, but we, but I, I think the problem is that you don't have a parking, we probably won't have a parking plan ahead of time. And, and this might be, we might be jumping ahead of ourselves here a bit about whether something's gonna be overly burdensome because I don't think we've really gotten into the, we haven't seen the, uh, the parking plan right yet because I don't think one's been created. So I, I, I understand, I think I understand where you're coming from that we don't wanna burden that every time the, the homeowners association wants to do something, they have to come back to the ZBA. I don't think that's right. But if they don't have one to begin with and we wanna require a parking plan, then they probably have to come back and show us that parking plan has been, has been done. Unless we wanna impose a parking plan <laughs> on them uh, to begin with. And then that's another possibility, I guess, Mr. Henry. Does that respond to your concern or not? Oh, it is. You broke up for a second, but I, I it, it does. I, I just, um, I, I think, you know, we're going through this whole comprehensive permit thing. I think as we consider this, we should think about ways where, if this is approved, that we alleviate some of those administrative burden on the homeowners so they don't have to mm -hmm. come back here. I think it's a good point. Mr. Wachilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to kind of respond to what Mr. Henry brought up too, um, you know, you might want to consider, you know, if for some reason the HOA decides to reconfigure the parking lots, if they decide to add more spaces or to redesign them or to take away certain spaces mm -hmm. or to reconfigure any of like the I guess uh, the the design of the entire parking layout that would also require change in the parking plan too. So I guess having a parking plan in place would be the most logical thing to do. But again, that's up to the board. Um, but usually, when you have four spots, you know, parking plan says you have four spots. But then when you increase that to eight spots, that means you also have to amend the parking plan too. And even if you were to do construction on something like that, um, that means you have to come back to the board anyways, because you're changing the site layout. So I could see your point that it does seem overburdensome for this type of project, but it's something that the board should consider because that could also address, you know, the guest parking policy or the sticker policy and stuff like that, um, that you would normally see in a management plan. So that's just something to keep in mind. Let's brush up. So I think we're talking about two different things. We're talking about the actual parking lot on the ground and whether that gets changed. And then we're talking about a parking management plan and whether that gets changed. And I think Ms. Murray gave us a good um, idea about 
setting conditions that could deal with a parking management plan and whether it gets changed or not. But I think if you actually changed the parking lot, that you probably would need to um, amend the comprehensive permit because it would be a change to the actual plan of the, the project. Plan. Yes. Yeah. And it could we it could determine that the park change to the parking management itself sticker or some other thing is is not necessarily significant so that it requires the um, approval of the ZBA. It may just be something that the building commissioner could approve. That's it could right. not yep. be a non-substantial change. We can mm -hmm. condition, we could establish that. Yep. yep. So yes. all they got to do is just call town staff and we look over real quick and then give them an answer. Yeah. Less burdensome. So, so just for clarity, um, for me, the overly burdensome part was not about physical structure because I agree if it's a change to any physical structure yeah they should get an amendment to the permit yes um but if it's something that it doesn't physically change anything i think we should give them the right to make those own decisions without coming back here okay miss greenbaum oh i didn't take my hand down sorry all right miss brush but did you just leave your hand up or did you have something else to say? No, there was one other thing. I don't know when you're going to go to the uh, public um, for their comments, but I wanted mm -hmm. to um, note that the planning board met last night and had a presentation Good. about this project. And I do have some, uh, I don't have anything written to give you, but I have some um, comments and recommendations if you'd like to hear them tonight. Otherwise, I can just put them in writing and send them to you. No, that I did intend to do that before we go to public comment and so this is a perfect time just Sh give us a summary I? of what this what, yeah give us a summary would be good all right so um well i wanted wanted to tell you that the planning board was uh, overall very impressed with this project they were impressed with the site design and the architecture as well as the um, applicants outreach to the community they thought that was all really good um, they did have some specific comments and recommendations, um, and I'll give them to you in a letter at a future date. But here are some of the things that they said. In terms of recommendations, they were <clears throat> they looked at the lighting plan, and they questioned whether the amount of lighting proposed for this project is too much. And they asked if it could be reduced and be more consistent with the character of North Amherst. Um, so that's something for you to consider. They suggested that the applicant re review the level of lighting that's proposed versus what is actually needed. And I think as Ms. Allen said that um, they base their lighting plan on certain standards that are nationwide standards. But some of the planning board members felt that perhaps the nationwide standards were a little over um, over ambitious for this type, for this project in this location. Um, they suggested that the applicant and also ZBA members, if they choose to do so, could look at the Pulpit Hill co-housing and Pine Street co-housing uh, as far as their lighting levels, and also you know, drive around some of the neighborhoods in town like Amherst Hills and Amherst Woods and see what their lighting is like. They also um, <clears throat> wondered about whether lighting should be controlled by an automatic system with a photo cell turning it on and off. Um, they felt that that might be complicated and it might be too sophisticated and expensive to maintain. Um, and they suggested maybe it should be controlled by a simpler, more traditional system that's less expensive. And that was a comment that was given by an architect who lives in the Pine Street co-housing who said cool. that recently their system has um, started to fail and they're facing um, large expenses to fix it and, and uh, update it. So that's something to consider. Um, they talked about vehicular, vehicular access to the pedestrian path and um, being able to control it. They wondered about homeowners being able to control Amazon trucks and delivery vehicles like pizza delivery um, from driving on the pedestrian driveway. And I think we heard from Ms. Jennings tonight that there is an opportunity to put a chain across between the two bollards and that someone could um, open the chain, take the chain off, if someone really needed to get through, but um, just you know, to think about, is there more that could be done there besides just the movable, the mountable curb, some signage, and that chain? Um, one of the suggestions was that there be a, a delivery vehicle area to park 
at the head of the path. I don't know if there's room for this, but someone did suggest that so that um, a delivery vehicle could park at the head of the path and then walk whatever they were delivering up to the residential um, unit. Um, in terms of the mailbox area and the sheds, they uh, the sheds that are kind of communal sheds, they said that um, this area, you could consider it as a gathering place for community members. And um, so are there any types of amenities? And I noted Ms. Jennings tonight said there is a bench there, so maybe that's sufficient. But they also um, recommended potentially putting in some um, recycling containers for paper because people might want to just, you know, sit there and sort their mail and, and uh, eliminate things before they bring them to their homes. Um, so just to make that area potentially more usable and more uh, welcoming, um, and then they also said, well, if you have two mailbox areas, um, isn't there a problem with someone who's delivering mail to know, should I go to this mailbox area for this residential uh, address or this one? Um, so they suggested it might be worthwhile considering consolidating the two mailbox areas into one, and then they would have one address and everybody would know where to go to get their mail. Um, let's see what else. Um, in terms of storage sheds, they some of them thought that the storage sheds that were proposed next to the units or as part of the units were rather small. And if people wanted to store uh, yard equipment and play equipment in there, they might um, not have enough space. So they said, well, you could consider making the sheds larger. Um, and then they also said, in terms of future, they thought, uh, and this was a suggestion given by someone who lives at the Pine Street co-housing, they've recently decided to put an additional uh, building on their property to store things that can't be stored in their personal um, sheds or their personal storage areas. So they, they're putting up a common storage building. So they said, well, maybe the applicant could designate <clears throat> a location on the site where the homeowners association could build one or more common storage buildings in the future and um, where they could keep yard equipment and play equipment. And that way that if that uh, location is designated on the plan and approved by the zoning board of appeals, possibly the homeowners wouldn't have to come back to the ZBA for, uh, you know, an amended, um, an amended plan or an amended comprehensive permit. So that was a suggestion. Um, in terms of the heat pumps and mini splits, they said uh, they would really like to see those screened. Um, they can start to be kind of a, an eyesore, and so that's something to consider. And then in terms of questions, there were some questions that they asked, but these weren't really recommendations, but I'll go through them anyway. Um, they asked about snow storage, and it looked like um, one area of snow storage at the northeast corner was potentially displacing some parking spaces. But I understand from Ms. Jennings tonight that those parking spaces are, um, I don't know the phrase that she used, but it seems like those are temporary parking spaces or somehow not, not permanently used by tenants. They're spaces where the garbage truck uses them to back up, but when the garbage truck isn't there, somebody could park there. So maybe that, that is a good place for, um, snow storage. Anyway, that's something that the planning board had questions about. Um, they also had questions about the maintenance of the exterior of the buildings and will individual homeowners be responsible for the maintenance, including uh, painting their siding and repairing their roofs, or mm -hmm. would it be better to have the homeowners association responsible for that so that, you know, one homeowner doesn't maintain his side well and the other homeowner doesn't. And, you know, th it's just going to cause differences in the way the property looks eventually. Um, and let's see, what other thing did they talk about? Oh, they asked about electrical vehicle charging stations and, and how they would work and whether they would be operated by a company and the residents would have an account with this particular company. Um, so anyway, those were things things that they asked. So I will write this up and um, send it to the Zoning Board of Appeals, but I wanted to bring those issues up tonight since you are talking about site issues, and that's what the Planning Board really focused on last night. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prestrup. Mr. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
So I, I have a couple of comments. And since we touched on um, exterior maintenance, I'll start with that. I, I was going to bring that up in the financial part of this presentation and because I had the same concerns. And sharing my own example, as someone who lived in a condo with an HOA, we were responsible for everything interior, everything exterior was the HOA. And it worked really well because everyone paid into the HOA dues. And I was going to suggest that that approach be taken here to Ms. Bestrop's point that alleviates um, 37 people doing 37 different things. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Um, because we, we've had issues with that. But going back to um, the lighting section, um, I, I would oppose um, less lighting um, for, for a different reasons. But this is North Amherst. Um, it is very dark. There's not street lights there. Um, the intended target here um, is a BIPOC community. Um, I'm concerned about safety. Um, police interaction with people, um, potential non-residents going there causing issues that creates things. I think there'd be more comfort if it was properly and well lit um, with the residents that are there. I think that should be considered rather than go with less lighting. So I, I, I would suggest that we don't reduce the lighting. Um, we think about um, safety concerns, not just... Um, <clears throat> residents, but of potentially what could happen. And as someone who lives in South Amherst, where it is extremely dark all the time, <laughs> I wish there was more light in. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I think with um, this community, I, I think having appropriate light in, I mean, it is a bit isolated where, where, where it is. And, and I think um, there, there's a safety and comfort concern, I, I think from the tar intended target audience here, and I think people will feel better if there was more lighting rather than less lighting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Ms. Greenball. Yes, I have lighting questions also. And I agree with Mr. Henry that in front of my house, I, I tell people where my driveway is by it's the first street light on the right hand side of the road coming up from the intersection. That's how that's the first one, and it's in, six tenths of a mile. So uh, maybe they can have the same amount of lamps, but much lower in height instead of, I don't, I don't think you need 14 feet in that highway, maybe, you know, eight or 10 is plenty uh, with a, 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 a some kind of a designer motif rather than a street light. I don't know how to say it. more domestic looking design. Um, getting back to the discussion of the lighting, did we talk about lighting for each of each unit so people would find the front door at night if guests were coming? I don't recall hearing that. I don't think it was discussed. Let's let's ask Miss Allen about that. Or do you have lights on the front of the buildings? Yes, we do. We've got porch lights on the front and the back that'll be controlled by the homeowners themselves. Okay. Mr. Wachilla, do you have something to add to this topic? Yeah. Um, so the question Hilda asked focused on kind of like the architecture of the building. Um, so I guess the presentation that was given to us tonight focused on site lighting instead of the lighting on each of the buildings themselves. Mm -hmm. But still a good question to ask. Um, so I just want to make that point clear to people. The other, the other thing in terms of the, the lighting for the parking lots and, and uh, whether it's 14 feet or 8 feet, when you look at the lighting plan, it gives you the number of, um, I, I don't know what the, what the, I forget what the measure is, but if you have a lower, if you have a lower light, it has to be brighter to cover more area or a greater, um, uh, it'll wash a greater area of, of, uh, of the, um, the property. And if you, a little bit higher light will, will, uh, will flood more of the area. And so I think, you know, I, I, I have to go back and Hilda, I think I want to rely upon the lighting engineers to give me what is the, the best lighting for the parking lot with the least number of fixtures, because I want to keep the price low and, but yet I want to have enough light to, for people to safely be able to negotiate the parking areas. Um, so I, you know, I, I think if you look at, if we look at that lighting, I'm just trying to 
brought up here. It's really hard to, for me to read it on my iPad, but we should take a look. I'm not just I'm not uh, saying we shouldn't consider it, but let's take a look at the number of foot candles that each uh, that that are there for the, the parking lot and the and see if that's sufficient and 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 then uh, let the my thinking is let the uh, the developer decide what they want to do with the, the style of lighting, but. Um, I want to make sure that there's enough foot candles to safely light that area and probably have fewer light poles than more. Because that's very urban looking for a farm, yeah. farmland. Yeah, the 14, I, I can see that, but it, it may fit with the, well, it's also something we can talk about whether it fits with the design of the, the architecture of the, of the I'll of look the, it uh, on plan. my big, I'll look it up on, on my big plans. Yeah, that we'll take, we, I'm reading this because I'm on an iPad, so yeah, it's hard to read. Anyway, that's that's my thought on that. It's my response. We'll talk about it again. I'm sure. That's great. So, Mr. Chair, uh, Philip has his hand up. Okay. Um, thank you. So, I have two uh, kind of real quick things. One. Uh, right now, uh, I am in agreement with Mr. Henry uh, about the lighting um, and kind of the purpose for safety uh, for the residents. Uh, but my second thing is for Ms. Allen. Uh, you had stated earlier that Valley would, uh, rightly so, take a position in the HOA initially until enough homes had kind of been sold. Do you guys have any specificity on that? Like what, how many units would need to be before, you know, you guys kind of take a step back yet or? Um, I'd have to go back and refer to uh, an email correspondence that I had with our attorney. She is on the call. I don't know if she's um, prepared to speak, but I can certainly um, see it's Rebecca Tebow. She is our attorney and um you could promote her and see if she'd be willing to speak to the um, conversation and the how that would work in terms of the number of units, what that number is. So there's slightly one issue. There's two Rebecca Tebos, and I don't ah. know which one to promote. So whichever Rebecca needs to be promoted, could you please kindly raise your hand? Oh, never mind. Made it easier. All right. So I'm going to promote the panel. And they both went up now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Hi. N nice to see everyone. Um, and thanks for the thoughtful conversations. Sure. Just, so, just before you be, just give oh, us your name and address for the record. Thank sure. You. Rebecca Tebow from Doherty Wallace, Pillsbury and Murphy. I live in Northampton. Um, so yes, Jess is right. That will be something that will be addressed in the condo documents. We've got several documents that I'm working on preparing. Um, they'll include the master deed, the bylaws, as well as the rules and regulations. And they'll develop a structure for how the condominium uh, association will function. And part, I mean, in, in addition to the parking issues and such and other and ability to change things in the future, um, they'll also address, address how the board of managers, I think that's what we'll call it, will function. You know, how are they elected among the members? And then built into that master deed is how the board of managers changes based on the developer's role in the project and as they transition out of the project and it's sold. And so there are various ways to do it, you know, 75% sale, then they have zero role um, uh, or, or other amounts, you know, after X amount of number of units are sold, then they have the right to control X, Y, and Z, but not everything. And so we just haven't gotten that far, but I do intend to get that far by, I believe it's a December 21st meeting. Yeah. And the reason why I bring this up is it's anecdotal, but I have personally dealt with a situation similar to this and by no means am I comparing you, you guys to my experience, but uh, Liv had, 
had a condo association with a condo that I owned. Uh, the developer had kind of said something similar, you know, as we sell units, we'll remove ourselves from the process. Uh, they had some issues selling the property, the properties. Uh, and the owners who actually lived on the property uh, essentially just felt like our needs and wishes after a while were being steamrolled over. Uh, so that's why I bring it up. Uh, just want to make sure that since, you know, with our target audience for uh, these properties, that we're empowering them uh, to mm -hmm. be homeowners. So that was the kind of logic behind yeah. the question. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Mr. Henry. And I think about understanding that you're working on the HOA um, a document. Can you commit to getting us something, a draft review by the 21st of December when we're discussing the financials and the HOAs and those documents? Yeah, that would be the plan that I would, you know, we would review it with the client and um, have drafts that they feel are, they're comfortable with proceeding with and we would get them to you before the December 21st meetings. They're 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 pretty lengthy and not that fun to read so I I wouldn't throw them to you right before the meeting. Yeah, we on something like that Ms. Thibault, we'd really like them a week ahead of time. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um that would be the the goal. I also have condo association experience and those are thick and dense and they're, they're not fun to draft either. So uh, they're not fun to read, but it's important. I disagree. Yep. I disagree on the fun to draft part, but that's why I'm over here. That's yeah, why, that's I why do you it. do what you do. That's yeah. why you do what you do so well. Yep. All right. So yes, to, to Mr. Judge's point, if we can get them, um, I, I would like to read them. I did um, with my prior HOA redraft or bylaws. So I do have some experience with HOA agreements, so I would like to review them um, before we vote on this. Yeah. Yeah. And before we have a discussion about them. I mean, that's yeah. a really, yeah, because we won't be voting until later, but uh, that's, we, we need to be, have access to them before we start discussing them. And thank you for your commitment to do that. All right, I would like to go to public comment. I don't want to shut off the board comments. If there are more questions, concerns, I think, um, this is the time to deal with the issues on the agenda today, but I'd like to get to the to public comment and then we can return if we have additional questions. But let's uh, let's open it up to public comment. Um, as per our normal procedure, uh, if you wish to speak, please indicate so by raising your hand on the, the Zoom app or or if you're on the phone, I think it's pound uh, star nine gets you um, in to the, the queue. When you're recognized, please give your name and address for the record. Try to keep your comments to about three minutes. I'll try to help you do that as best I can by using a timer. Uh, but uh, Rob, why don't you identify the first person who has their hand up? So I'm not seeing any hands up yet, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess Just, we'll give people a few more minutes to- Yeah, let's to give them a that. minute or two. I know we had, like, I looked at, it was, there were about 21 or 22 attendees at one point uh, when I looked at it now so there it's, might be uh, some people now it's seven but maybe you know they had the questions <laughs> answered throughout this process of site design that they decided not to say anymore <laughs> or they have better things to do I there guess. you go no or no, they're no. actually all just on the call on video now <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them are also valley staff so, yeah. uh, so okay. three of them are valley staff <laughs> <laughs> um and one is our architect so it couldn't be because everybody... dot com well it couldn't be because they're watching the world series because that's over so there's others <laughs> all right not seeing any hands mr chair oh. all right well then we'll move on um one last shot for people on the board or the staff if need be to ask other questions raise issues or mention things that you wish to deal with in the com coming hearings that we have on this. Okay, I guess what we need to do is continue this until November 30th. So what I'd like to do is entertain a motion from a board member that we continue the public hearing on ZBA 
FY 2024-03 until November 30th at six o'clock. Do I have such a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. Do I have a second? Second. Um, any discussion on the motion to continue the hearing, the public hearing? If not, the vote occurs on the, on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. The vote is five to nothing, uh, unanimous, it passes. Um, is there any new business, Rob? Do we have anything that we need to discuss? Uh, we've gone over the schedule. You made that available to everybody. Uh, the only thing we have, I know that the only thing in the schedule that is still kind of up in the air is the final meeting because of members um, travel in January. And um, the fact that I know that myself and Mr. Meadows are gonna be unreachable uh, for some portion of January. So we'll have to come up with a, a date, a final date later, I think probably the first part of February, but um, I will not be able to participate for about 10 days in the middle of January because I'll be outside of even cell service. So um, we'll have to come up with a date. Other than that, I don't think there's any other um, scheduling issues. And you can talk about what we got coming up next week for the, uh, the regularly scheduled meeting. Sure, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so basically, um, in terms of that final meeting date, uh, we'll have to, we don't have to decide that tonight, but we will have no. to figure out eventually when that last meeting date is going to be for conditions and waivers. Um, but also, um, we have to ask the applicant and, and have an agreement with them that they're willing to go beyond the uh, statute limitations for how long the public hearing can be open for. So usually we would need like a signed letter from them. And uh, when we have that letter, you know, that's when we can officially continue it past, uh, I forget, I right. think it's day 120 or something like that. I'm not sure how many days total. Um, in terms of the upcoming schedule, we do have uh, three hearings scheduled for next Thursday, November 9th at six. Uh, the first of which is a continued hearing from the October 12th meeting. And then we have two new special permit applications, uh, both of which are residential permits. One of them is a change of management for 320 West Street, and the other is 318 Lincoln Avenue, converted dwelling. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the continued hearing, 62 Taylor Street, the uh, non-owner-occupied uh, duplex building. And then uh, for the time being, Mr. Chairman, we don't really have anything else on the schedule. Uh, it's getting a little bit light for December, aside from these 40B hearings. Um, we do have way down the road, Shootsbury Road Solar hearing, has been continued to early January. Um, the date is escaping me, but other than that, that's that's the schedule for the next uh, several meetings, Mr. Chairman. And then there's another 40B coming up, but that's not gonna be on the agenda until um, spring, is that correct? We're anticipating like late spring, early summer. Uh, okay. We're actually meeting with uh, Wayfinders in a couple of weeks to discuss it with them. I think they're still in their, uh, planning process for this project. So they're still pretty early on, um, but of course we'll update the board as more progress has been made on that specific uh, project application. So I guess I wanna just again, thank the board members for um, participating on these alternate Thursdays. We normally don't meet on every week, on every Thursday, but we've been doing it night. And the schedule isn't as full as we thought it was going to be when we first planned these hearings. Um, so I know you're putting in extra time. I appreciate it. And we may have some regularly scheduled Thursdays that we're, we don't even have a meeting, but we have a meeting schedule for this one. So um, your willingness to do that is making this easier to process this 40B application than uh, it otherwise would be. So again, thank you very much for your additional commitment and time uh, on this project. Are, is there anything else that uh, people want to bring up before we adjourn the meeting? All right. If not, I'd entertain a motion that we adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. The motion to adjourn has been made and seconded. This is not a debatable motion. The vote occurs. It has to be a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. Thank you all again. We appreciate your work. Thank you. We'll see Thank you, you next Thank week. Thank you. Thank you for appreciating our work.
I know. Well. <laughs> I can't have a jam and have a 